So first of all, let us agree on something. Socialism should not be trendy. The way I view socialism is those of you who follow football. In every country, there's this crappy football manager that every year they get a team and they have horrible results and they relegate the team in the second division and somehow next year they still find a job. This is the case with socialism. It fails time and again and yet the idea never goes away. So the track record of socialism is a disaster. In its lightest version, the social democracy, let's say, version, it is ruining economies. My country, Greece, back in the day, the UK in the 60s and the 70s, or many countries in Latin America. But what do our socialist friends tell us when we bring the example of social democracy? They say, ah, this was not real socialism. Okay, then let us check the record of real socialism. The real socialism has not only wrecked economies, it has left behind piles of corpses. What type of piles of corpses are we talking about? Well, think about it this way. In seven decades, socialism, real socialism, communism, has left behind more deaths than what Christianity has left in millennia. This is their track record. So normally, if you were a socialist, you should be embarrassed. You should be embarrassed to even show your face. And yet, it's still the trendy ideology. More young people in the United States, but also in Europe, say that they sympathize with socialism rather than with capitalism. Could it be then that socialism is trendy because it has a very inspiring vision? Well, it used to. It used to offer plenty to all. Trotsky said that every citizen in Soviet Union should have a car. This is the equivalent in the 30s of saying today, each one of you should be able to have a flying car or a private helicopter. That's a nice vision. Sign me up for this. But is this what socialism is selling you today? No. Socialism has gone from promising you, I'm going to take you to the stars, to taking away the plastic straw away from you because it's polluting the environment. It has gone from promising you plenty to actually, promise, to actually promising you, quote, sustainable development, which is a way of saying it is promising you glorified poverty. So why then? Why is it if a movement which has a horrible track record and not an inspiring vision, why is it still relevant? And the reason is because they have a very, very potent weapon a weapon that quite often we do not understand. And that weapon is their moral appeal. No matter how bad they screw up, no matter how many piles of corpses they leave behind, they can still tell you, hey, we're the good guys. They can say, oops, you know, things, mistakes happen, but we stand up for good causes, for equality, we are our brother's keepers. We want to make sure that everyone has what they need. So let's test this. Are their ideas actually good? Are they actually the good guys? So what is the number one moral ideal of socialism? It's the idea of altruism. It's the idea that you shouldn't live only for yourself, but it is the idea that you should serve others. Now, who are these others' changes? It could be the international working class, it would be the third world, it would be the poor, these days it's the polar bears, or it could be the polar bears of the future. But one thing is standard, sacrifice is good. You giving up stuff for others is good. That's their one main idea. Their second main idea is that the group is above the individual, that the needs of the many, as they say, override the needs of the few. This is another way of telling you the needs of the many override your needs. And the worst thing is that, what is the answer that most people have to give to these moral claims? They've heard these moral arguments forever. They've heard it from their teachers. They've heard it from their priests. So they're completely disarmed because they're telling you, what, do you, do you dare to object that you should sacrifice for others? Do you dare to object 
that the needs of the many override the needs of the few. Do you, do you dare to object that if someone is in need, then your freedom should be curtailed? And of course, no one dares to object to that. Here's the, and that's the moral blackmail, that if you dare to question these ideas, you're a bad person. So let us see something else then. How do the supposed enemies of socialism react to these ideas? Do they tell you that, no, we completely reject these ideas. You have a right to your life. You have a right to your happiness. Is this what the right is telling you? I would say no. They actually amplify and agree with the ideas of the socialist. They do agree that you're your brother's keeper. They do agree that the needs of the others get above your own needs. The founder of the welfare state, Bismarck, called welfareism practical Christianity. How can you be against this? If you believe in the Christian message, how can you be against taking from some people and giving to others? Or if you follow American politics these days, you see that Trump very proudly says, I will be the one who will not cut Medicare and Social Security. How can you have freedom if some people have needs? Then we have to curtail your freedom in order to give to these people? Or what about the idea that the group is above the individual? Does the right really question this idea? No, they agree that the group is above you. It's just a different group this time. It's not the poor or the international working class, it's the nation. And if the nation is above you, then your time, your money, and even your body belongs to the collective. This is why, for example, you have in many countries the military draft. Or this is why, again, in the United States, you have this new right, the Trumpian right, telling you the goal of the government is to sustain tradition or to sustain, quote, our way of life. Not to protect the individual. We've given this up as an ideal. This is bad. The ideal is to protect, quote, the common good. And of course, you need someone to tell you what this common good is. So socialism is trendy because they have the moral high ground. And also, they know how to fight the battle of ideas. They come out and they talk about values. They talk about justice. They present themselves as idealists. And I would tell they are the idealists. Their ideas are horrible, but idealists they are. They go to the barricades. They glue themselves to the ground. They say, look, whatever we do, we are the good guys. And they, they shout it. We are crusaders, crusaders for good. What is our answer to that? What is the freedom movement answer to this idealism? Well, we mostly have graphs, numbers, statistics. Well, if we cut taxes by 0.2%, uh, then the GDP is going to go up by 0.8%. No one cares, sorry to tell you. People are not going to go to the barricades for GDP. It's ideas that move history. It's not GDP that moves history. Or think about the cool art they have. Think about the, the, the heroic vision they have created. And compare it with the way many on the right defend capitalism. It's a very weak defense. Basically, our def not ours, but most people's defense against their left is, well, capitalism is not that bad. On the one side, you have people who go to the barricades. On the other side, you have people who say, well, you know, we're not that bad. I mean, we're better than communists. We're not going to kill people. This is not inspiring. There was a prominent person in the conservative movement who wrote a book called Two Cheers for Capitalism. Not three cheers, two cheers. Why? Because he said capitalism, you know, it's okay, it delivers the good, but there's nothing moral in it. Then why should we fight for it? If there's nothing moral in it, what's in it for me? I want to be an idealist. Or I was reading lately a book by supposedly one of the great defenders of liberty, Francis Fukuyama. And he said, liberty is good, but not too much freedom. And the good thing in liberty is it's not that bad, it's not as bad as communism. This is not inspiring. 
this is putting people to sleep. So on the one hand, you have idealists who tell you that if you, do, if you don't follow what we do, you are bad people. And on the other side, you have people who say, well, let's meet a bit more in the middle and we are not as bad as the other side. This is not the way to fight socialism. The proper way to fight socialism is to ask one simple question. And this question is why? Why is it that everyone and anyone who is in need has a claim in my life, but I don't have a claim in my life? Why do I have to pay rent in order to be allowed to live in society? Why do I have to, quote, give back? To whom and why? Why is the need of people whom I've never met override my needs or the needs of the people I love and the people I care for? And why should this morality, which I don't even consider it a good morality, why should it be forced to me? Why is coercion okay? These are the questions we should be asking, but unfortunately, not many are asking these questions. But it is these questions that can actually destroy the supposed moral high ground of socialism. And if you take this away from socialism, they're left with nothing. I've seen a book out there with Lenin's face which says, what does socialism is good at? And every page inside says nothing. That's true, but they have the most important thing, or they think they do. They have morality on their side. So at the end of the day, the joke is on us. We are losing from people who have the worst record of a political movement in history. And we're losing to them. But I will leave you with some good news. And the good news is that there has been someone who has asked this question, who, who has asked this why. There has been someone who did make the moral case for capitalism. And that's very important, the moral case. Not, oh, it's, you know, it's a system that delivers the good. No, that it's a good system. And even more, that it's the only good system. There is one person who made the case that production and entrepreneurship are good. Good, not to be tolerated, not, oh, please let us produce and we promise we'll give 50% away, please don't hurt us. No, we have a right to what we do and what we do is good. And this person, is Ayn Rand. And it's the only, her philosophy is the only philosophy that establishes that your life is yours. End of story. Your life is yours. You don't owe anything to anyone unless you choose to enter into a, somehow any kind of relationship with them. It's the only philosophy who tells you that your happiness is your highest goal in life. If you accept this, no one can tell you that your goal in this life is to serve others. It's the one philosophy that tells you that love and kindness and benevolence, all these are great things, but only if they serve your life, only if they enrich your life, and only if you choose to relate with people based on these values. If supposedly brotherly love makes you a servant to others, then this is not anymore a value. And it's the only philosophy that tells you that freedom is an existential need. It's not a luxury. It's not something that, well, it could be good if we had some freedom because GDP is going to go up 0.1%. No. Freedom is essential for you to follow what is important to you in life. From your romantic life to your productive life, freedom is an existential need. And her philosophy, Ayn Rand's philosophy, is the only one that tells you that capitalism is a moral system. And if you want to get a glimpse of what a true defense of capitalism looks like, I would encourage you to read or to reread Atlas Rugged. If you cannot find it out there, I've left some of these, so conveniently you can download it with a QR code. So the battle of ideas out there, it's harsh and it is unforgiving. And the freedom movement, we are showing up to this battle, as they say, we show up with a knife in a gunfight. And the left is using heavy artillery. 
and tanks because they're using morality. And this is why socialism is still trendy. But we do have a nuclear weapon to obliterate them. We have a nuclear weapon that tells them your morality sucks. And this is why you've had this horrible track record. Your theory sucks, your ethics sucks, and this is why you've left behind this pile of corpses. This nuclear weapon is the ideas, is the philosophy of Ayn Rand. All we need to do is lift this nuclear weapon and fight with it. Thank you very much.